Let's go on a little tour to here, 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 and here. All of these are places you can visit in video games made from the 90s to the early 2000s. Today, this graphical style is known as low poly, or more technically, low polygon mesh in three-dimensional computer graphics. Back then, this is what video games looked like, early attempts at three-dimensional gaming, as they made the jump in between pixel art and the incredibly realistic graphics of today, embracing experimentation and working with limited computing capabilities. Some of my favorite childhood games have what people now refer to as the low poly aesthetic on consoles like the PlayStation 1 and 2, Sega, Saturn, and Dreamcast, and the Nintendo 64 and GameCube. I remember seeing N64 graphics for the first time at a friend's house and thinking, wow, this looks just like real life. I was looking at this. Let's all teleport somewhere chill. As we sit here in the Chow Garden, I want to remind you to like, comment, and subscribe. Helps me keep making cool content like this that you can watch while you eat dinner or before you go to bed. Mash that subscribe button right now, like you're mashing A or X. Go ahead, hit it, press the button. You know you want to. In this video, I'm gonna be explaining low poly graphics, exploring how technical limitations created incredible characters, landscapes, and memories. Further analyzing how those experiences evolved into nostalgic appreciation. Essentially, how and why retro graphics make us feel so warm inside. Get ready for a relaxing journey through 90s and early 2000s gaming nostalgia. This is Dansplaining, the low poly aesthetic. Before we get into aesthetics, let's get some technical info out of the way first. Low polygon mesh is a term used to describe three-dimensional computer graphics. They use a smaller amount of polygons in modeling a shape, in comparison to high polygon graphics that we see in most AAA games today. Polygons can have any number of sides, but are commonly broken down using triangles for display. The more triangles in a mesh, the more detailed the object is, making the object more computationally intensive to display. According to this video by Garbage, each polygon model in this era was made up of around 500 or less triangles. The textures that covered said models were also only about 128 by 128 pixels, which is literally this big. Developers utilized flat shading more than smooth shading in this era. Smooth shading being more rounded and blurred, thus holding less polygons. Flat shading being more angular and blocky, with each polygon further emphasized. From my research, it seems like Nintendo games were more likely to use smooth shading, while PlayStation games generally utilized more flat shading. Which makes a lot of sense considering Nintendo games are more cartoonish, and PS1 games like Silent Hill or Resident Evil 2 were more visually based in reality. So we have two divergent visual techniques commonly used, cartoonish versus real. Here's Tails from Sonic Adventure, and here's Snake from Metal Gear Solid. Both of these games came out in 1998 and were likely developed using similar technology, but with very different approaches. If we look back to a classic low poly game like Super Mario 64, we can see that only so many shapes can be displayed on screen at once. Especially as the camera moves dynamically to follow Mario around, the entire scene shown on screen needed to be taken into account in terms of rendering, including the character, enemies, ground, walls, and all environmental details. All of this went into what is known as the polygon budget. Lighting was also a huge aspect of this look. Each game took very different approaches to the relationship between shadow, light, and color. Instead of using dynamic, fixed lighting, they displayed the base colors of the textures. Basically, the models weren't shaded or lit in the same way they are today. Artists were responsible for creating realistic lighting by texture shading on polygon models. But what tools were people using to create all these graphics? There weren't exactly industry standard programs at the time since this was brand new technology. Instead, different studios were expert in different programs, such as Nendo and 3D Studio, running on mid-90s computer software like Windows 95 and DOS. As a reminder, all this tech was super cutting edge during this time period. There's a word you've definitely seen online over the years that I feel is incredibly loaded, aesthetic which is defined as the study of the mind and emotions in relation to the sense of beauty. The first time I saw this word was on the legendary 2010s Tumblr, where people would put the word aesthetic under a photo of literally anything. It didn't matter what it was, it could have been this, this, or even this. What the hell were people thinking back then? I, like, I don't understand. 
Eventually, the word left Tumblr and people started using it in real life, saying that someone had a great aesthetic if they looked cool. Some now use it as an adjective, saying that something is aesthetic, like, wow, Lil Uzi Vert, your car is so aesthetic. Yes, this is actually Lil Uzi Vert's car. Respect. Right now, Zoomers and Millennials alike use the word on social media platforms like TikTok as an attempt to show off their possessions or overall look. Literally go on TikTok right now and type in any descriptors you can think of, followed by the word aesthetic. Here's 1990s aesthetic. Or cyber goth aesthetic. Aesthetics are such a thing online that they even have their own wiki. Some of the top aesthetics on there are Coquette, a hyper-feminine aesthetic that incorporates elements of youth and teenage girlhood, and Dark Academia, which revolves around classic literature, the pursuit of self-discovery, and a general passion for knowledge and learning. The actual two most searched terms on this wiki are Frutiger Arrow and Y2K. Both are rooted in early 2000s nostalgia, a period we're now about 20 years removed from. If you're washed and almost 30 years old like I am, the 90s and early 2000s were your childhood. So these aesthetics are the perfect segue for us to get into the low poly aesthetic, which exists somewhat within the larger Y2K aesthetic. Let's dive into some examples of low poly games. Ones that depict stylized spaces, objects, and characters, realistic or not. And that meant creatively forming shapes using low polygon meshes to form everything. Limitations were clearly the catalyst for the low poly aesthetic. They couldn't have existed during any other era of computing, and thus feel deeply rooted in the 90s and early 2000s. Here we go into the world of Shenmue for the Dreamcast. This is the low poly aesthetic at its finest. Shenmue takes place in the city of Yokosuka, Japan, which is depicted masterfully as a backdrop for this action-oriented game. We see our main character, Ryo Hazuki, traversing the city. While it's not an absolute, perfect, realistic detail, we still get a sense for what makes Yokosuka unique, visually. As Ryo sprints through a side street, we're experiencing the scale of this city, with taller skyscrapers in the background, as well as a dense concentration of homes and shops in the foreground. There are neon signs, motorcycles, snack stands, unique NPCs, and more. All of these are basically low pixel textures, plastered purposefully onto different polygon shapes. It took careful art direction and a strong sense of literal world building to combine all these elements together to make a living, breathing city. If we look towards the characters in Shenmue, we can see their 3D depictions of anime designs, which is a smart way to allow them to exist as cartoons in a somewhat realistic world. People playing Shenmue felt they were in an uncanny space between anime and real life. That to me is the special sauce of low poly graphics, a lack of cohesion that felt unique to the media landscape of this specific era. Games like Shenmue have aged pretty well in my opinion. Their characters are expressive and active, even in a flat world. Heck, even games that haven't aged that well are kinda charming if my nostalgia goggles are tight enough. Moving over to a contemporary of the Dreamcast, we've got the PlayStation 1, home to the sub-aesthetic known as PSX. When most people think of low-poly graphics, they think of the PlayStation 1 and 2. Sony is a company that's constantly trying to push the envelope with their games graphically. The PlayStation was their first foray into the gaming market, so they needed to do it big. This was one of the gaming world's first experiences with an entire 3D graphic producing console. And Sony was first to jump into the deep end ahead of Nintendo, Sega, and others. Across the PS1 library, you see a huge variety of experimentation graphically. This was a time of pure innovation in the realm of visuals. There was the moody, cutting-edge Hideo Kojima stealth adventure Metal Gear Solid, the vibrant, rhythmic paper cutout Parappa the Rapper, and who could ignore the classic JRPG Final Fantasy VII. This game was advertised at the time as having some of the most mind-blowing graphics ever. During this early stage of gaming, they were completely right. The creative choices here led to an advanced gaming experience. This game changed everything for JRPGs in the West, due majorly to the cinematic cutscenes, blocky but lovable characters, and a dramatic story. In my opinion, the characters in Final Fantasy VII look like little toys moving through the world of Midgar. It reminds me of those scenes you create in your head when you're a kid playing with action figures and dolls. With the added nuance and cinematic drama that still is being adapted and remade today. Each location is an explorable diorama players were able to squeeze every detail of play out of. Fight scenes were turn-based and somewhat static, 
but lively enough to provide a sense of danger and urgency. Moving on to a more lighthearted PS1 game, we've got Ape Escape. In huge contrast to Final Fantasy VII, this game is literally about catching crazy monkeys. It's a silly but important game in the PS1 library when it comes to graphics, a fully realized cartoon universe that's colorful, playful, and expressive, more akin visually to Rare franchises on Nintendo platforms like Donkey Kong and Banjo-Kazooie. Ape Escape was actually the first game to use a DualShock controller, allowing players to control their character using the two joysticks constantly shifting the axis of vision graphically. This game is in no way trying to be a realistic environment like Final Fantasy and Shenmue. As one of the best platformers on the PlayStation 1, Ape Escape has an exciting core to it. When dropped into each individual map, players are hungry to explore what makes it special, in an effort not only to find the crazed monkeys, but to run, swim, and solve their way across a purely fun 3D animated world completely separate from our own. That's the brilliance of Ape Escape. It's Tom and Jerry with its own grand storyline and a spiky-haired anime protagonist. Which brings me to our next subgenre. So we've talked about Nintendo and Sony a little bit, but what about the giant blue hedgehog in the room? Sega! The former giants behind the Sega Saturn, Genesis, Dreamcast, and more have some of the more niche but iconic games of this era, many of which belong in the sub-aesthetic known as Sega Blue Sky. This low-poly sub-aesthetic is literally named for its vibrant, clear blue skies, an idyllic feature of many key Sega titles of this time period. Like Sonic Adventure, Crazy Taxi, Jet Set Radio, and more, these games are capped by a gorgeous, saturated blue sky with dancing, fluffy white clouds, sometimes taking up almost half the screen during gameplay. Blue skies give players an energy reminiscent of a beautiful blue summer day, where the possibilities of fun are limitless and life is simpler. It provides a portal into an instantly energetic environment, which matches the action of these games well. Sega Blue Skies are far more idyllic than many dystopian PlayStation titles, which featured moodier gray, green, and brown color palettes. For someone who needs a touch of happiness, the Dreamcast is a great place to start. Let's take Crazy Taxi for a ride. Obviously, our blue skies sit atop the screen as we race through the streets. We breeze by familiar branded locations like Pizza Hut, KFC, and Tower Records. Just little ads used as texture to give these areas more lived-in flavor. One of the main goals of this game was to give players the feeling of an arcade game at home. As the title dropped on the Dreamcast just one year after the arcade machine, Sega's goal was realism and high frame rate action. As the Dreamcast was incredibly advanced for this era, but that didn't really help with sales. What separated Crazy Taxi from the wide array of racing and action sports games on the Dreamcast was its hyper-euphoric gameplay, music, and undeniable swag which shows from the character select screen that displays anime-inspired characters, clothing, and cars. We see flat-shaded palm trees, skyscrapers, food stands, and more that we now know are simple polygons with low-res images fitted onto them. Still, the gameplay and visuals definitely stand up today. Which brings me to our next Sega Blue Sky title, the Sonic Adventure series. This was the second attempt at a 3D Sonic title following Sonic 3D Blast on the Sega Saturn. The newer hardware of the Dreamcast provided an opportunity to create the ultimate Sonic game, truly creating a rift between the classic pixel art Sonic and a new era of 3D gaming. This meant updating the old character designs to a newer, edgier, more Western look. Sonic and his friends were all made taller, slimmer, and ready for the new millennium. But it wasn't just the characters that got an update, Sonic's world did as well. The team did a ton of boots on the ground research across the globe to give these environments a more realistic feel. They visited several locations across Central America, including temples, jungles, and ruins. In the past, the design team had to draw artwork by hand and approximate it pixel by pixel. But now the Dreamcast allowed them to use scaled down photos as textures. Apparently the blue skies are actual photos the team took while in Mexico. This resulted in one of the best-reviewed Sonics of all time. Many hold Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2 in incredibly high regards, especially within the confines of the Dreamcast. One of the internet's favorite aspects of this game is, of course, the Chow Garden. A virtual pet simulator filled with mini-games, a game within a game within a game. This gives people a break from the non-stop action of Sonic's adventure, and simply provided players with a cute and fun place to hang out and chill with their little pets. For many, the Chow Garden sub-game was just as memorable as the gameplay of Sonic Adventure 2. I feel like Chows are some of people's favorite low-poly characters. They're round, kawaii, and packed with personality, and fit super nicely into their idyllic little island with gorgeous blue skies as a background. Just look at these little critters. Just look at them. I love them so much. 
I can remember a time when I thought low poly graphics looked awful. It was around the Xbox 360 or PS3 era, so likely from 2006 to 2012. I was a cynical middle schooler slash early high schooler, completely entranced by my new 360 and its awesome array of games like Fallout 3, Bioshock, Skyrim, and of course, Kung Fu Panda. I could not fathom someone stomaching such low-res textures and undetailed character models. But oh how the sands of time change everything. As life went on, the 90s and early 2000s grew ever more distant. As soon myself and a lot of people online would gain a whole new respect for the low-poly aesthetic. Let's jump into what I call the Nostalgia Canyon. A graph that explains how nostalgia works, especially in this case. On the left side we have interest, or how much the subject captures attention, conversation, and respect. On the bottom we have time, from 0 to 25 years. A product like video games have a ton of interest when they first release. Because it's in such a fast-moving, ever-changing industry, conversation around it likely recedes after a few months to years. There are a few exceptions to this rule, like free online games that regularly update, like Fortnite, League of Legends, and The Sims 4, but that's a convo for another time. As we travel forward through time, interest completely dips down, creating what I refer to as a canyon of nostalgia. Typically, people won't have a supreme reverence or appreciation for something that came out three to five years ago. It still feels a little too recent, even in today's fast-moving world. But something peculiar happens around 10 to 15 years after something releases. Slowly but surely, interest picks right back up. I can remember getting to college in the early 2010s, and a lot of people had their N64s and GameCubes with them. We all were from the same generation, and thus collectively had built nostalgia for a game like Super Smash Bros. or Super Smash Bros. Melee, which had been released in 1999 and 2001, respectively. If we return to the Nostalgia Canyon, we can apply our learnings to our 90s and early 2000s low-poly games, which have been late growers but are now seen and appreciated by a new audience, mainly due to Gen Z discovering these games for the first time. Many of them weren't even born during the PS1, Dreamcast, and N64 era, so they've been able to access videos, discussion, and emulations of these games, creating common ground between generations. <laughs> I'm back in the chow garden vibing, here to thank you for watching this video. As a reminder, please like, comment, and subscribe so I can keep making cool stuff like this. We've gone on an awesome journey through time, specifically exploring 90s and early 2000s low poly video game artwork, breaking down what low polygon graphics are, where they came from, and why we love them. Nostalgia is one hell of a drug. Anyways, I've got some chows around here to attend to, and uh, Pomeranian. Alright, I'll see you next time.